I mean, we touched on this a little bit when we were talking about feedback and how to give and receive effective feedback. And it's, it's the shadow side of some leadership behaviors or the shadow side of the, the unhelpful behaviors of things that we kind of assume are great, you know, things like compassion or care or heart or vulnerability. And I thought that would be a meaningful thing for us to dig into a little bit because it might be a little bit counterintuitive and it might be a little bit against the dominant narrative. You know, sometimes I go on LinkedIn and I see be an authentic leader, just like through the feed or be vulnerable through the feed. And nobody's actually stepping back and saying, is that always the case? Should we always be doing that? Um, so let's, let's pick on one of those. Maybe, you know, I'm always keen to talk about vulnerability um, and kind of the pros and cons of that. I'd love to hear your perspective on how you've seen vulnerability used well in the workplace, how you've seen it maybe used less well or have unintention, unintentional consequences. Yeah, um, I've seen it. <laughs> Fortunately, the not used well comes to mind first. Um, I, I, I've just seen it. Um, I, and you know what? To some extent, I might have done this too earlier in my career. I'm more conscious of it now, so I could probably still be doing it. But you know, there's this, at some point there was almost this movement of where, you know, leaders started to transcend the hierarchical divide and, or try to anyways. And, you know, I'm just, I'm just like you, I'm just another human being and, and, and yeah, let's go have drinks and let's have everybody around. And I just remember getting this, this feedback once that, um, I shared, I, I, I was thought I was being transparent and sharing, you know, my feelings of how we were doing, the decisions we were making as an organization. And, I, and I'm on the leadership team. And what I didn't realize at the time was the impact of me sharing that, that it had on those people in the room that were like, oh, wow, like, are we, are we not doing good? Are, are we gonna get cuts? Like, um, are we gonna go through another round of layoffs? Like, you should have seen this thing just, they felt covered enough to share their fears with me. I had no real, like, I thought I was being, I don't know if I would have called it vulnerability. I think I, in my mind, I was thinking uh, uh, transparency. That is not vulnerability, by the way. I'm just, I want to be clear. Like, but I can see how some people think that's vulnerability. Like, I'm just sharing this thing, but there's an impact to that. Uh, and it was an impact. It, I was sharing a feeling that I had, which had no data behind it, which which I didn't truly understand, which was more really a reactive um, thought. Mm -hmm. uh, but you could see how dangerous that could be. Uh, so that's the, I would say the shadow side of vulnerability uh, and where I've seen it been not used well. I've been talking a while. So why don't you give us an example of like great vulnerability? <laughs> oh, yeah, it's funny. Cause I go to the, I go to the examples <laughs> of uh, vulnerability not done well either. Um, actually, no, I've, I've got, I've got one of both. And so, an example of vulnerability that has stuck with me for a long time, a friend of mine, Lisa, um, we worked in addictions treatment together. Uh, we kind of actually, we started about a week apart. We were shift partners. We kind of moved through for about a dozen years almost. We worked together. Um, and she has this beautiful ability to cry, actually. Like we're sitting around the campfire with staff, with clients, with families, didn't matter. She would cry, but she would, like she would feel the feelings that she was having, but she would retain her like an understanding of the power dynamic that she was in. She would still hold the space for people. She didn't take that emotion and translate it and make it someone else's problem. And that's probably the example that I'm thinking about when I think of somebody who in a power position, if you take your vulnerability, if you take that emotional experience you're having and you make it the problem of the group or the team or the people in the down power position to manage it for you or to co-manage it, that's a misuse of power. And that for me really stood out when I started having my own family. It's like, I would never make my kids responsible for my emotional wellness. Like that's a misuse of power for them to feel an obligation or responsibility for dad and how dad's doing emotionally, psychologically, spiritually. Like those are needs that I get met in other relationships. And so it's thinking about, again, I guess it's the, the goals of the relationship or the needs and the values within that relationship and who's responsible for what in that. And I think that the vulnerability conversation is slippery because it's easy for a leader to just like kind of throw that or park that the actual power dynamic to the side try and be an authentic raw human, but accidentally and unintentionally make other people responsible for their wellness, right? Which is kind of an inversion of the power dynamic. And when you're on the receiving end of that, it doesn't feel right. And I actually remember a time when a very senior leader in the organization, newly hired, walked in and said, I don't know how I got this job. I don't know really what I'm doing. I'm going to need lots of help. And there was a collective like 
sigh slash like pushback from the table, like not maybe actually, but you could just see the disengagement of half a dozen senior <laughs> leaders who were like, I've got enough to do. I don't need to do your job. I don't need to help you learn your job. Right. And so that, and it was the first meeting. Like there's lots of things that were wrong with that display of vulnerability. It came from a good place, wanted to share. This is how I'm really feeling. But the impact was, oh, sh like shit, like similar to the experience that, that your team had when you shared. It's like, oh, are we going under? It's like, oh, what am I now responsible for that is going to add to my plate? So, um, yeah. So going back to the example of, of, of Lisa and her ability to have an experience, be authentic in that experience, but still hold the power and hold the space in the way that is expected of that, right? And to, to be human and to be real, but to do that in a way that um, doesn't transfer responsibility to other people to manage that. It's just, it is what it is. Um, so that's, you know, an example or a couple of examples of times that I've seen that. And, and I think that it's not talked about enough, to be honest. I think that vulnerability is one of those things, courage culture being another one, radical candor, some of these shorthand words that we've used that are actually, there's a lot going on in any one of those concepts that when you start to unpack, it's like, oh, there's more here than just always say what you think, which I think is what radical candor and like something like that can, can translate into is like, oh, I can just be an unfiltered, I guess walk around without a filter and tell people exactly what I think. And then it's up to them to like process it. And that's, that's a pretty slippery, dangerous place to play. I mean, when, even when just hearing that, I'm like, that almost sounds like an enemy to vulnerability, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, no, I agree with like, those radical candor, radical honesty, anything radical um, is, is picking a pretty, a side of the spectrum there. <laughs> yeah, and, and at some level you get it. And, but as soon as you think about a power dynamic, some of these start to fall apart. And I think that that's probably my, my main critique of most mainstream thoughts or thought leadership around leadership skills and competencies and, and, and practices is that in the absence of understanding power, sure, radical honesty makes sense. Vulnerability on, on the surface makes sense. But as soon as you recognize that we're inside of a power dynamic, like, well, what's the implications of that? And you start to, those start to unravel and you start to see that they're, they, they exist on a place on the spectrum of leadership mm -hmm. and it's not as black and white. And I think that that's probably, you know, a critique that I have of mainstream thought leadership around, around these topics is that they become like unmovable objects. It's like vulnerability, good, right? And it's like, well, yeah, yes, and there are downsides, which we've talked about already. Like you and I have experiences that I think everybody listening to this could point to an experience of vulnerability. They're like, yeah, that didn't go well. That wasn't helpful. That didn't do what we we'd wanted it to. Yeah, I've, I've also seen, and maybe this isn't the word vulnerability to describe it, but I've also seen really great leaders. I, I, I There's this article that describes it. It's called giving away your Legos to allow someone else to build something. But I've seen... I've seen really great leaders transition out of an existing role, create a new role and a new opportunity for someone, which puts them in a vulnerable position because, you know, usually by the time we've, we've established mastery, we're known for this thing, right? And to let go of that thing and have someone not only come in and do it, but maybe do it better, right? Which we all know is going to help the larger organization in the end and the people are trying to impact. I feel like, I, I, I think about that like really great leaders get out of the way and create new opportunities, mm -hmm. right? They know to let go. Um, and we see this too. If when that doesn't happen, teams get overwhelmed because this new leader keeps, well, not just the leader, but the team keeps adding things, right? To their plate, trying to take the, to the organization in, in a new direction. But there's a bit of fear to let go of the things that no longer serve. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. To me, there's some connection there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I eventually these conversations seem to drive us back to the the at risk and at stake mm. place and and for me also the model that we use to, to to look at levels of impact you know at the individual level the small team or the we small we level and then the big we the big organization and it's really easy and i know i'm guilty of this is like i can walk around all day in, in like the i place like what's in it for jeff how does this impact me like what do i need to do to, to move the needle on this and and occasionally we'll play in the in the we space but when we get to the big we like what's the impact here what's at stake for the organization i think that's a great point that the great like great leaders are able to see that at the system level you know we talk about human-centered systems conscious approaches to making sure that yes individuals need to you know recognize their skills grow their competencies like contribute in meaningful ways and how does it impact the system and i think that that's 
you know, it's a little bit of a side tangent from this conversation, but when we look at most organizations, when they're looking at intervening on teams that maybe aren't performing at the highest level, they automatically go to the level of the individual. What do we need to do about Pablo? Oh, let's take Pablo and let's get him a coach or let's take Pablo and let's send him to a training, right? Or let's performance manage him, right? Let's get a PIP in place, like a performance improvement plan, or, or we, we really tend to hone in on the individual level. Uh, and it's interesting things shift when you back up a little bit and you say, well, how's the team dynamic? Like what's, what's at play here that allows this to occur, right? Or encourages this, incentivizes this to happen, right? When we, we take a few steps back, we start to think there's, there's other options and there's maybe more sustainable or bigger impact approaches. And so, yeah, I mean, that was a little side tangent from this conversation, but, you know, I think that's important. I think that that's recognizing that when we're coming at something from an at-risk place, right, what do I have to lose? We get this fear kind of thing and we react out of that versus at stake. And then the different levels of impact, I think is important, but I'd love your take on it. Yeah. So would you, you know, uh, how you make sense of things when you think the word vulnerability would, and you think of a leader, would you, or, and just for anybody listening, our definition of a leader is anybody who takes responsibility for themselves and their world. And so if you think of an individual and their be and their level of vulnerability, do you see them as being more like positioning themselves at the at stake side of the spectrum? Which is hard, which I, I have an assumption is harder to do. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a more proactive, like you have to be, you have to be in a big picture, proactive mind frame. You can't be in a reactive drinking out of the fire hose, putting out fires kind of place to be intentional. And I think that that's probably the conscious use of vulnerability versus the unconscious use of vulnerability. Mm. So when we think about like, what's the point of me being vulnerable is because I have a need that isn't being met, right? And if it's a safety and security need and I'm feeling anxious about something, if I unconsciously and reactively communicate that to my team that I'm responsible for, that's when it's possible for them to be like, oh shit, right? Like they're, they're anxious, they're scared, they're in a fear-based place. And now they're transmitting that to us without clarity on like, what's our role in supporting this versus at stake if we're doing being proactive and intentional and conscious with that vulnerability, it's, it's, a, it's a different conversation because the outcome for us as a leader is not to get our own needs met. It's to create space for a conversation about an important thing, right? About vulnerability. And it's less about, you know, anytime a leader unintentionally or accidentally centers their own needs in a conversation, whether it's being vulnerable or, or something else, I think that's when we're at risk of unintentionally causing strain or tension or damage in those relationships. And so for me, it's a consciousness versus unconsciousness. I think vulnerability is a great tool, right? For creating connection and for being human and creating trust and um, learning, right? We have to be vulnerable to learn. We have to put our hand up and say, hey, I don't know a thing. Can somebody teach me, right? Your example mm -hmm. of the president who goes to the marketing team and says, hey, I'm not the subject matter expert. Tell me what you need, right? And by the way, I'd love to learn more about X, Y, and Z, right? Being that that's a level of vulnerability. Right. They could easily come in and pretend to know it or, you know, or not even go in the first place because they don't want to be in that position of learning something new or not contributing as the president, but contributing as just a stakeholder in a group. And so, yeah. well, this individual also, I mean, this is a level of consciousness, even in the slight, the small behavior that he took, he said, I'm going to take notes in these meetings because mm -hmm. which traditionally you know, when you think of a hierarchical organization, the note taker isn't typically, you know, unless you're doing research. And so for him to do that really sent a, a message, <laughs> right? That, that, that I, anyways, it was powerful move that. And so I find that there's other ways than just saying it. Right. <laughs> and I think that actually, no, I don't have, no, I don't know if I have research to back this up, but I would say that behavior speaks louder than, than mm. words do for a lot of teams. Um, I know it's interesting when I think about my journey into leadership, I had to be pretty intentional, not getting too disconnected from the people that I was there to lead, right? It's super easy to do that, right? And to speak first in meetings and not take notes. And, you know, I remember intentionally going and doing night shifts, like awake overnight shifts, which I hadn't had to do since I was a youth worker, but I was like, you know what, that's, it's kind of the equivalent of sleeping in the shop floor, if that's what needs to be done right? And supporting the team with what they need. And there's lots of times that I would go and I'd cook meals for the team because that's what they needed is somebody like, I don't want to cook another meal. So I'm like, well, I can do that. Um, yeah. So I think it's a, the behavioral 
piece there is really important. I think that it's easy. And I think that's probably when I think about some leaders that we've worked with or I've worked with over the years, it's actually a disconnect between the words they use and then the behaviors they exhibit yes. that causes that they'll be talking vulnerably, but then they will, they'll be closed through their behavior. They won't change behavior as a result. And that tension is, gets pretty obvious um, for teams. Yeah. That's, that's a big one. The, uh, the cliche walk the walk or drink your champagne mm -hmm. responsibly your own champagne. Yeah. 